God's got your back. Amen. Daniel chapter 10, verses 1 through 15. If you'll join me today in the word of the Lord. Daniel chapter 10, verses 1 through 15. I'll put it on the screen so you can see it up here. Yes. The King James text today reads in this fashion. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar, and the thing was true. But the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hibekel, then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Euphes. His body also was like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a vision of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves." Therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet heard I the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face and my face toward the ground. And behold, an hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright. For unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard. And I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, one of the chief princes. I just want to point out, Michael is not the chief prince. He is one of, there are others as well, all right? He said, one of the chief princes came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. For yet the vision is for many days. <clears throat> and when he had spoken such words unto me, I set my face toward the ground, and I became dumb. Amen. Want to talk to us today? God's got your back. Amen. Amen. Master, we love you, God, and we thank you today, Lord. For the word of the Lord, we thank you today, Jesus. For the presence of your spirit, 
which inspires us, encourages us, and gives us strength. The Word of God promises, They that wait upon the Lord, they that do the Lord's bidding, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like as eagles. They shall walk and not grow weary. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Master, today we claim the promise of your word. Lord, as I do that for which you have called me, I believe that divine strength and help will come so that I might deliver the word of God in a fashion that will bring blessing to the people of God. Encourage today, inspire, uplift. Allow our faith today, O oh God, to reach new heights and deeper depths than you. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, precious name. Amen. Praise God. Amen. You know, Daniel was going through a particularly difficult situation. There was something that the Lord had shown him that he was waiting to come to pass and yet it was not coming to pass in the time that he anticipated, which further caused him more disturbance and more trouble. I'm going to tell you, there's nothing worse for somebody who operates in the prophetic than God showing you something. I know what I'm talking about because this happens to me and it, it's, it'll drive you about half crazy. The Lord will show you something, but you don't know when it's going to happen. You just know it's going to happen. And then as you're waiting on it to happen, you begin to grow real concerned. Oh God, am I going to look like a liar? Am I going to look like a false prophet? Am I going to appear to the people of God to have misspoken? And you begin to grow really weary and really nervous and anxious about when is this thing going to come to pass? And Daniel began to seek the Lord and ask the Lord, you've shown me this. I've been waiting on this. It hasn't happened. I need to understand. I need an answer. I need to know. <laughs> And I'm going to tell you, that's, that a lot of times, that's a very desperate place to be in when you're sitting there. I've, I've prophesied things, and then it has come to pass 20 years later. But I told, I, I prophesied it 20 years earlier. I told them, just sure as I'm alive. I told the church I grew up in, when they elected a pastor who was not the will of God for that church. See, in that church they vote for pastors, which got to tell you, in my view, is about the stupidest thing you can do, but that's beside the point. I like the way the Church of God set up pastors better than the Assemblies of God. The Assemblies of God, a man comes in and basically auditions for the job. He preaches two services. And then the people pray and they seek the Lord and they say, Lord, is this the man you want for this church? Well, you know most people are going to vote strictly on whether or not they like his look or whether or not they like his voice or whether or not they like his preaching. You know, they're not. most people in the church aren't spiritual enough to really seek the mind of God and the will of God. Well, sometimes it works and sometimes it don't. There are times when... I believe the people really sincerely were seeking the mind of God and the Lord was able to speak to them and we wound up with some great pastors. But we had this one young man come into our assembly to, a, to a try out and he was a young man, had never pastored a church before. But he graduated from the same Bible college that our church secretary had graduated from. And boy, she was pushing for this kid. She was pushing for him, Rose, because she wanted to give this guy his first break, you know, give him his first pastorate. She figured, you know, he graduated from the same school I did, and I just feel like I want to give him a break, you know. And when it come time for the voting, the people were really being pushed by this woman she was just saying everything she could say to try to get people to vote yes for this guy. And I knew in my spirit that this guy was not, the he was so far from being the right guy, it wasn't even funny. 
Well, she pushed and pushed, and all of a sudden, they voted, and guess what? They voted him in. And when they elected him in, the spirit of prophecy come over me. And I began to weep and I began to wail, literally, literally, to the point that you could hear me outside of the sanctuary, wailing at the top of my lungs. And the Spirit of the Lord inspired the words in me, Ichabod, Ichabod is written over the door of this church. The Spirit of the Lord has departed. Because you would not hear the voice of God. You would not listen to the voice of God. The Spirit of the Lord has departed. Said this man is going to destroy this church. He is going to hurt this Amen. church. And there will be no move of God. There will be no longer will there be a presence of God. And that little church I grew up in, my God, it used to be a wonderful, powerful, anointed, Holy Ghost filled, on fire, Pentecostal church. Long story short, go to that church today. It's bigger than it's ever been, and it's deader than a doorknob. There is no move of God in that church anymore. There is no anointing in that church anymore. After this guy, they elected another guy, Pastor, and the new guy they elected was the most condemnatory, judgmental, negative preacher you ever heard in your life. But you want to hear the funny thing? People filled the church to hear him. Why? Yeah, you preach hellfire and brimstone, and I mean to tell you, people will flood into the church house. You preach the message that I preach today, and you'll be lucky if you can get a few people in the building. Right, Rose? Right. Oh, let me preach people into hell. Let me preach against these people. Let me preach against those people. And all of a sudden, the church house will fill up. Well, of course it will, because that's what carnal ears like to hear. See, carnal people feel bitter about themselves when their pastor is putting other people down. See, as long as I preach against queers, then you people feel holy. As long as I preach against those with alcoholic addictions and drug addictions, as long as I preach against the prostitute, then it makes you feel holier, makes you feel better about yourself. <laughs> That young man destroyed that church. My God, by the time he left, it had dwindled down in number. And he had run up so much debt, it took the church decades to pay off all the debt that he had accrued. But I tried to warn them. I tried to warn them before they voted. I tried to tell them, folks... This is not the man for this church. This is not the man of the hour. If you will listen, if you will let God speak to you, if you let the Holy Ghost speak, I guarantee you He'll let you know this is not the man of the hour. Funny thing is, we went home that night after they elected this guy. After I wailed and mourned and prophesied in the church, I went home and in the car I was, telling my mother, I said, oh God, I was trying to warn them, I was trying to tell them, but they just wouldn't listen. And my mother reminded me of something that I'd completely forgotten about. She said, don't you remember you told me a few days ago or a week ago about a dream you had? And in your dream, you were trying to get over to this church, to the church I grew up in. But there was a bridge that separated where you were and in real life there was no such bridge okay but in my dream there was this big long bridge that went between the town I grew up in and the next town and on top of the hill I saw the church that I grew up in and I felt this desperate need in my dream I felt this desperate need to get over the bridge and to, to tell these people something they needed to hear what I had to tell them but I couldn't cross the bridge there was no planking on the bridge at all and in order to, I tried to climb it, I tried everything in my power, but the girders that made up the bridge were too far apart. They were separated by too many feet, and I couldn't go from one to the next. And it was impossible for me to get across that bridge to tell the church what I needed to tell them. 
And I remember telling my mother about the dream because when I woke from the dream, I felt so troubled in my spirit, I couldn't stand it. I said, Mom, this dream has left me feeling so bad. My God, it's left me feeling so terrible, you know. And I don't know what it means. Well, lo and behold, after they elected this man, my mother said, you remember that dream you told me about? And immediately it clicked, and the Holy Ghost clicked in my spirit. I said, that's right, God warned me. He told me that I was going to have a word from Him that I was trying to bring to this church, and that, I, that no matter how hard I tried, I wasn't going to be able to get it to them. And I brought it to them, but boy, they weren't going to hear it. Well, I'm going to tell you, when God speaks to your spirit and reveals something to you in the prophetic and you're waiting for it to come to pass, it, it can be a curse at times. Because you know that your integrity is on the line. People trusting what you have to say and believing what you prophesy is on the line. And, and this is what Daniel was going through. And he began to pray and seek God and fast. He didn't let any food touch his lips. He just cut everything off. He said, Lord, I'm not going to let any good thing, I'm not going to eat anything, I'm not going to do anything or taste anything until I understand more about what you've shown me. Because I'm not seeing it come to pass. I need to understand this better. There are times we're in situations and we just, for the life of us, are completely devoid of understanding. We, we don't know what's going on. We don't know when things are going to happen. We don't know when things are going to come through the way that we feel like God has shown us. And in the meantime, we're, uh, we're anxious and we're frustrated. And we're asking God, Lord, please, at least God, at least give me something. At least clue me in a little bit. <laughs> I've been trying to do a work an LGBT affirming apostolic work now for three, dozen, uh, for three decades. I had a vision. I had a dream in my spirit. I'm not saying God gave it to me, but I had something in my heart that I felt that God wanted to do. And I, I just, oh, I mean to tell you, I came in with such enthusiasm. I came in with such high hopes. And for three decades, my hopes have been trampled and spit on. I, instead of what I had hoped for, I've had false brethren turn against me and accuse me of all kinds of negative garbage. I've had people come into the church and leave the church because they don't know how to act spiritual and they don't know how to act right and they don't know how to behave. Got a bunch of people in the community who won't make even the slightest effort to actually come and be part of the church and contribute and contribute their time, their talents, their gifts, their resources because that's what it takes to build a church. And honey, I mean to tell you for three decades I've just been living with my dream being trampled on. You don't know how many times I've gone to bed at night and said, Lord, you just, you got to give me some idea, God, of a timetable. You got to give me some idea of when this thing is finally going to break loose. Because I believe in God that one day it's finally going to break loose. I refuse. You know, like that chorus we sang said, I'm standing up on the wall. I'm not coming down. Honey, I'm up here building. I'm going to keep building. I ain't coming down. I'm not going to stop. I've got a vision. And until I'm pastoring a church full of Holy Ghost filled people that love God and know how to pray and know how to live right and know how to worship and know how to work for the Lord until I see people on a weekly basis being saved and filled with the Holy Ghost and healed in their body until I see miracles happening until I see what I have seen in the past what I know God can do in the present I'm going to keep struggling to realize that vision I don't care what goes on in my body. Honey, if I let what goes on in my body dictate whether I keep ministering or not, I got news for you. I wouldn't have started affirming ministry in 1993 when I did because in 1993, 
I had a situation come against me that literally threatened to have me dead within a year, the doctor said. Here it is. 30 years later, I'm still going strong. You see, even then, when I started my affirming ministry rose, I didn't know if I was going to be able to preach for a year and then I was going home. I thought that was possibly, probably what was going to happen. I literally did. I, yeah. I thought, well, if I have a year, then at best, then I'm going to preach for Jesus until I go home. And that's the mindset that I had when I started my affirming ministry. 30 years later, here I am still. And every inch of the journey has been a treasury. Every inch of the journey I've been marching through mud. It has not been easy. You want to know sometimes, God, give me some kind of sign. Tommy, there are times you say, Lord, just tell me something. Just show me something. You don't have to tell me everything, but just give me some insight. Give me a little clue as to what's happening and how long it's going to take. Am I telling the truth? That's what Daniel was going through. The Lord sent an angel to tell Daniel, Daniel, I've got your back. You see, from the first day that Daniel was seeking God for answers and for clarity, from the very first day the angel informed him, God heard you from the first day, and he sent me to help you in this situation. However, the enemy hindered me. Satan hindered me. And it's taken me three weeks to get freed up so I could come and do for you what you need me to do. I'll tell you, there are times the Lord will do the same for us. Amen. He doesn't always send an angel, but sometimes He will communicate to us in any number of other ways. There are times when we need to hear from God and we need to know that He's got our back and all of a sudden the preacher will preach a message on that very topic or he'll preach a message in that vein and you're sitting there saying, Oh, thank you, Jesus. I'm hearing from heaven. That's exactly what I needed to know. God's got my back. Am I telling the truth? Yep. Amen. I tell you, there was a time here a little while ago, Tommy and I... Uh, had visited, I talked about it before, we visited a, a local Pentecostal Jesus name, huge church for a community meeting and, and I met the pastor and the pastor was nice enough even though I knew he knew who I was he was nice enough to extend an invitation to us to come worship with them sometime, which to be honest with you shocked me well, I wanted to go but I kind of had that feeling, yeah, as soon as we get in the building, we're going to hear a message about how wicked gay people are and how evil gay people are, and, you know, and I'm going to hear all this negativity, you know. So I wasn't quick to want to go visit, Rose. <laughs> I wasn't looking to hear all that negativity and all that condemnation. But all of a sudden, one week, I felt this push from the Holy Ghost to go visit this church one Sunday. And I said to Tommy, I said, I don't know why, but it, I feel like God is pushing us that we need to go visit this church this Sunday. And I was still nervous about all the things I just talked about, but I felt God pushing and pushing and pushing me. You need to go, you need to go, you need to go. So finally, Tommy and I got together, and we went to their church that Sunday, and we went into their sanctuary, and I filled out a visitor's card and all that. Long story short, the pastor's going through all the visitors in the building. And at the end of the list of it, I didn't think he'd even bother reading our names. At the end of the list, he said, well, we have Brother Charles with us today. He called me brother, which shocked me. Because us Pentecostal folk, I'm going to tell you, if we think you're backslid or if we think you're not serving the Lord and you're, you know, you're not a Christian, we don't call you brother or sister. 
Exactly. That's a title that is reserved for saints. You know, that's you a gotta title. Be to get that title. You, yeah, you got to be part of the family to get called brother or sister. He said, Brother Charles Morrow's with us, he said, and his friend Tommy. And I was shocked, but I was pleased that he said it the way he did, you know. Well, then the service went on. And he got up and preached a message, and he didn't say one negative, condemnatory, nasty word, not a one. But he preached a message, remember that time, that I needed so bad, I needed to hear that message so bad. Oh, I'm here to tell you, God has ways to let you know He's got your back. Hallelujah! Yeah. God has ways of letting you know, I've got your back. He, he pushed on my spirit, you need to go, you need to go and I went and there was a word from the Lord through that pastor that day that I desperately needed to hear some of you watching today are sitting in your seat and you're saying thank you Jesus I needed to hear this today I needed to be reminded that God's got my back hallelujah I'm not in this thing alone I'm not going through this journey by myself God is with me even when I don't feel him, even when I can't sense him, I know he's there because he said he'd be there. What well, about me? Hallelujah. When I was in the what hospital in 2000, my brother Michael brought a picture of the Lord Jesus walking on the water, I believe it was. And he hung it up in my room. I was on life support. But he hung it up on my room straight ahead where I could see it when I opened my eyes. One day, I remember, I looked up at that picture, and I literally remember thinking that I couldn't speak because I had the tubes down my throat and all that. But in my mind, I remember saying, Lord, I can't feel you. I have never in my life been in a situation where I could not feel God at all. But as I lay in that hospital bed on life support, I literally could not feel God at all. It was the worst sensation you'd ever want to feel. It was the worst thing you'd ever want to experience. Feel like you're in this thing all by yourself. You're going through one of the greatest trials. I believe when the Lord Jesus Christ cried out on the cross of Calvary, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I can't stand people who try to read stuff into Scripture that it doesn't say. God had not forsaken the Lord Jesus Christ. He could not. Jesus said that the Father could not forsake him because the Father of the Bible said God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. He couldn't possibly forsake him. It wasn't about what was happening. Listen to me, children. But it was about what the Lord in his flesh was feeling. He literally felt, as it were, God forsaken. Do you follow what I'm saying? And therefore his words reflected not what was happening in reality, but what he felt like. See, we act like people in the Bible had no emotions, they had no feelings. That's idiotic. He felt abandoned. He felt alone. In that moment, he felt strictly 110% human. The divine was nowhere to be found because he was suffering in his body so severely. It was so painful. It was such a struggle. As I lay in the hospital bed, I looked up that picture and I saw that picture of the Lord. I thought to myself, Lord... I can't feel you. I've never in my life been in a position where if I prayed and spoke your name and talked to you that I couldn't feel you. I said, but God, I've been in this hospital now. I don't feel you. I don't feel like you're here. And then I turned the tables on the enemy and I said, oh, oh, oh but I know you're here. <laughs> I know you're here. 
I know you're with me. You said I will never leave you nor forsake you. Hallelujah. Said you said that you'd be here. And I believe your word more than I believe my emotions. I believe your word more than I believe my feelings. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell you today, saints, whatever you're feeling, don't trust your feeling. Trust the word of God. Hallelujah. If the word of God said, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus, then you can trust that. Yes, yes. Don't trust what you're feeling because your feelings will cause you to compromise. They'll cause you to abandon your faith. Oh, I'm here to tell you, God has sent this fat old preacher today to tell you that he's got your back. Hallelujah. Sometimes the Lord will send a word. The Bible said a word fitly spoken is as apples of gold. In other words, when you hear the right word at the right time, <laughs> boy, it's sweet, isn't it? Amen. It blesses you. It touches your soul when you hear the right word at the right time. Amen. But then there are times when God will speak to us and let us know He's got our back and He'll use the gifts of the Spirit. One of the gifts of the Spirit being word of knowledge. I've told this story in the past, but I'll tell it quickly again. I had just moved to Athens, Texas. Brand new in town. Didn't know nobody. Hadn't, hadn't even... I had preached in a little independent Trinitarian Pentecostal church for months there. But the Lord laid on my heart that my little brother and I needed to move to this town. So I rented us a little house and I moved us to Athens. I was driving down the main drag one day and the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, That's where I want you to go to church. One God, Jesus' name, Apostolic United Pentecostal Church. I said, Lord, you got to be kidding me. I wasn't in this movement at that time. <laughs> I said, Lord, you got to be kidding me. You want me to go to that church? You want me to go to a UPC? He said, yep. I said, okay. I walked in the door of that church and told the pastor, said, you ready for a new member? It looked at me like I was crazy. Who does that? You know, the problem with too many people call themselves Holy Ghost filled today is they no more know how to walk in the Spirit. They no more know how to hear from God than they know how to climb Mount Everest. They don't know nothing about walking in the Spirit. They don't know nothing about hearing from heaven. I've had people come into this church just bragging about the fact they had the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I'm going to tell you something, those people were the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. They would walk into one mess after another mess after another mess after another mess and they constantly would try to claim that God was talking to them about this and God was talking to them about that. And I mean to tell you, they were a disaster. It's a pastor who's been in this thing for as many years as I've been. I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, my God, man, don't you know anything about walking in the Spirit? Don't you know anything about hearing from God? Because all the evidence I'm seeing says you're clueless. But when the Lord told me where he wanted me to go to church, I got news for you, folks. I didn't stand there and argue with God. I didn't complain. I said, okay, if that's where you want me to go, that's where I'm going to go. I had no intention of going into the apostolic movement, none whatsoever. Wasn't even in my thought process. But God knew what he was doing. The Lord was with That church, the pastor never one time preached a message on the oneness of God. Not one time. To this day, it troubles me that he didn't. I'm like, well, what kind of one God, Jesus' name, church, the preacher never preaches on the oneness of God? That seems pretty strange to me. But anyway, so I was not convinced of this thing because of his preaching, because he never preached on it. Finally it came to me when God revealed it to me, and God showed it to me. But let me move past that. The Lord spoke to me to go to this church. I hadn't even been there yet. Because we literally had just moved into our little house. And on the corner of the street we were living on, my brother Dallas and I, there was a little uh, Dairy Queen. 
We used to go in there quite a bit to eat. But in Athens, this little town in East Texas, they actually have two Dairy Queens in Athens. One over here near our house and another one down on the other side of town. Well, one day Dallas and I rode into uh, Canton where we had been living. And uh, we visited with Sister Chambers, this blessed old Holy Ghost. Talk about somebody who knows how to hear from God. Talk about somebody. See, that's why I know a fake and a phony from a true thing. Because I've known the true thing. And honey, when you know the true thing, there ain't nobody going to fake you out. Sister Chambers, that lady could hear from the Lord faster than you could hear from your mother. I mean, she, she, that lady could hear from God like he was standing right next to her. And we went and we used to, I, I loved her. She and I had become real good friends. She was like an adopted grandma to me. So we went to visit her one day. And I told Dallas, I said, honey, Sister Chambers is going to ask us to stay for lunch. I said, but we're not going to stay. I don't want to, because she'd give away every ounce of food she had and leave herself nothing, you know. I said, I don't want to do that. I said, we're going to leave later. I said, I'll take you somewhere to eat, but just, you know, we're not going to eat her food, okay? So she later invited us lunch. I said, no, Sister Chambers, I promised Dallas I was going to take him somewhere, so we're going to go and, and let you eat, and, and we're going to go and, and do what I promised Dallas we'd do. We left her house. We drove to the... They had a new uh, pizza joint there in town. I forget if it was a Pizza Hut or something. I drove up in front of the Pizza Hut, put the car in park. All of a sudden, the Holy Ghost, see, don't try to fake me out, folks. I keep telling you over and over again, I know what it is to hear from God. I know what it is to walk in the Spirit. If you're somebody who just talks the talk and can't walk the walk, you ain't going to fool me, trust me. I put my car in park, and all of a sudden the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, Don't eat here. I want you to go back to Athens. I said, Okay. Dallas, do you mind if we go into Athens, Steve? He says, Why? Because here we just pulled up in front of the pizza restaurant, you know? I said, The, the Holy Ghost just told me we need to go to Athens. I said, I, I got a feeling in my spirit there's somebody in Athens the Lord wants me to minister to. He said, okay. So, put my car in reverse, backed out of the parking spot, drove all the way 30 minutes up into Athens. We get to Athens and there's one intersection that you're at. If you go straight, you'll go to the second Dairy Queen. If you make a right, you'll go up and head toward our house, and you'll go to the first Dairy Queen, right? So we get to that intersection, and I said to Dallas, I said, where do you want to go eat today? He said, well, how about Dairy Queen? I said, all right. I said, you want to go to this other one? We always go to the one by the house. So do you want to go to this other one instead? He said, sure. So the light turned green. All of a sudden, literally, I can't... It was like the Holy Ghost took the wheel of my car and I began to turn my car to the right. We're going to go to the Dairy Queen by the house. He said, what are you doing? I said, I don't know. I said, I just feel like God wants us to go to this other Dairy Queen. He don't want us to go to the second one. He wants us to go to the one we usually go to. So we drove up. you got to remember, I told you, I preached in this town for months at this little independent uh Trinitarian Pentecostal Church. So, I mean, I kind of knew the town a little bit, and we had spent some time in the town. So, anyway, so we went to this Dairy Queen, pull in the parking lot, get out of the car, walk into the building. As soon as I walk in the building, literally, I saw a woman taking her tray, going over, sitting down at a table, and the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, That's her. That's who I want you to minister to. I looked at her. Now, I'm not condemning anybody. Don't misunderstand me. But I come from old-time holiness stock, you know. The lady, Pentecostal ladies, had high hair and long sleeves and long dresses. And they didn't wear makeup and they didn't wear jewelry. Well, this lady's hair was cut and it was frosted. And she's wearing a little bit of makeup and a little bit of jewelry. She was wearing a skirt, but... You know, I looked at her and I thought, well, Lord, she don't look Pentecostal or anything. I said, if I walk over to her and tell her that you sent me to her, she's going to look at me like I'm crazy. But the Spirit of the Lord said, I want you to minister to her. 
So Dallas and I placed our order, and uh, I paid for it. And I told Dallas, I said, here, you wait for the food, and when it comes, bring it to a table and eat. I said, I need to go talk to this lady. So I began to walk over toward the table where this lady was sitting. And all of a sudden, this high hair hole in this Pentecostal lady with a long dress and long sleeves walks in. And she sees this lady and she goes over to her. Oh, well, hello. And they start hugging and, you know, talking. And, and I thought to myself, well, praise God. Maybe she at least knows something about Pentecost. She won't think I'm totally crazy. She knows a Pentecostal woman, so maybe that's, you know, I'm judging her by her appearance, mind you, which I shouldn't have done, but I was. So that lady leaves for a minute, and I come over to her, and I said, Ma'am, I said, I realize you don't know me, and I may sound crazy as a lark to you, I said, but I'm a Pentecostal preacher and the Lord sent me here to minister to you. She said, oh, praise the Lord, I'm Pentecostal. And I said, oh, you are? I said, what church do you go to? She said, oh, I go to the United Pentecostal Church up the street. And I thought to myself, she goes to the United Pentecostal Church and she don't have the high hair and the long hair. Now that other lady that went up to the counter, she looked like she belonged to the UPC. This lady didn't. And I said, oh, wonderful. I said, the Lord spoke to me to go to that church. I said, my brother and I are going to start going to that church soon. I said, we're just trying to get everything settled and situated. I said, I hadn't even been there to visit yet. She said, oh, it's a wonderful church. You'll love it, blah, blah, blah. So I sit down. About that time, here comes the other lady, who I later knew. She became a very good friend of mine. That other lady became a very, very good friend of mine. And this other lady comes over, and she says, do you mind if I join y'all? I said, well, by all means. So she sat down with this lady on the other side, and I sat across from them. And I said to her, I said, I'm a Pentecostal preacher. I said, I know that y'all don't know me. I said, but God spoke to me. I was in Canton, 30 minutes away. God spoke to me to come to Athens. I drove to Athens. He told me to come to this restaurant. When I came to this restaurant, he told me to talk to this woman right here. I said, God sent me to speak to you about something, to minister to you. And the lady said, well, I'm all gung-ho, said, you go right on ahead. I reached out and I took her hand. And as I took her hand, God began to pour out a word of knowledge through me. A word of knowledge is when you speak something through the Holy Ghost that you cannot possibly have any knowledge of in yourself. It has to be God. And I begin to speak to this lady, and I begin to tell, the Lord sent me to tell you that He knows how lonely you are. He knows how heartbroken you are. He knows how discouraged you are. He knows that you're on the verge of wanting to quit your walk with God. He knows that you're on the verge of giving up, even trying to live for the Lord. He knows the pain that you've been going through. I said, but honey, He also knows that something that you view as a potential answer to that pain is the wrong decision for you. And you're about to make a decision that you know is wrong. And if you make that decision, you're going to wind up in an awful bad place. And the Lord sent me to tell you he knows your pain. Don't think for a moment. What am I telling this lady? God's got your back. Hallelujah. I said, God's got your back. You don't need to make the decision. You don't need to make the choice that you're right now contemplating making. Because God sent me here to let you know that He's got your back. That lady began to weep and cry. All of a sudden... <laughs> Her and the lady next to her began to speak in tongues. We're in the middle of a Dairy Queen in East Texas. The both of them started to get happy in the Holy Ghost sitting at the Dairy Queen. I mean, they're speaking in tongues, praying in the Holy Ghost. Well, I can't help it. You let the Holy Ghost start moving, I'm going to jump in on it. And I mean, next thing you know, there's two women and one man sitting at a table. All of us just lifting our hands toward heaven, talking in tongues, worshiping God, praising God. 
after a while, I don't know how long, but it was a pretty good while, this lady introduced herself to me and she said, about a year, I think it was, or two ago, she said, my husband, who I raised my children with in this church, came home one day. She said, I never thought we had a minute's trouble in our marriage. She said, he came home one day and literally just pulled out a piece of luggage and started packing. She said, where are you going? What are you doing? He said, I'm leaving. This marriage is over. I'm filing for divorce. She said, I was never so shocked. I was never so stunned in my entire life said this thing she said it was the most incredible thing I've ever experienced she said my whole world was turned upside down she said he left me he went down the road a few miles and moved in with this younger woman apparently he'd been having an affair with this other woman she said now as if that wasn't bad enough she said then a few months later, I was sitting in church one Sunday, waiting for the service to begin. She said, and in walks my ex-husband with his new wife. And she's carrying a baby. She said, and they sit down several pews behind me. She said, I have never been in so much pain. I have never hurt so bad in my life. She said, I have never felt so rejected. I have never been so shocked by a set of circumstances. She said, I've been so lonely and so depressed. She said, I started cutting my hair and I started doing stuff that I never did before. She said, I've been doing just all kinds of things, trying to feel better about myself. And she said, and and she said, and I know why God sent you here today. I know it just sure as I'm alive. She said, there's a Mexican fella who does her lawn or something, you know. And she said, he really is crazy about me. She said, and he actually proposed marriage to me. She said, and he's a devout Catholic. And he proposed marriage to me. And she said, and I was literally feeling like, yes, I think I'm going to do this. I'd rather be married to this man than be by myself and, you know, go through all this. She said, oh, but she said, let me tell you, brother. She said, then God sent a Holy Ghost filled preacher my way. And he let me know that God's got my back, that he knows my pain, that he knows my struggle, that he understands my loneliness, and that I was about to make a decision that was all wrong for me. She said, well, I'm here to tell you, brother, I heard every word you said, and I know it was a word from God. She said, I'm not going to marry that fella. She said, hallelujah. She said, I'm telling you, I have never felt more like God is real. I have never felt more like God is looking out for me, like God has my back, than I do right now. Sometimes the Lord will let us know he's got our back. And he'll use the word of knowledge. Or he'll use one of the gifts of the Spirit. That's why the gifts are in the church, folks. One of the things that's troubled me over the years, we've had a few people come through that were just proud as peacocks that they had the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And they literally looked at themselves as being better than other people in the church that hadn't yet received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. These people would say to me, well, brother, isn't it just wonderful that you and I have the Holy Ghost? And boy, what a shame this one done and that one done and this, you know. And oh, they just thought themselves so proud because they had the Holy Ghost. Didn't know how to walk in the Spirit. Didn't know how to hear from God. Didn't operate in any of the gifts of the Spirit. I'd go through experiences. I'd go through struggles, I go through sickness, I go through all kinds of things. And never once, brother, did that person ever come to me and say, Brother, God gave me a word for you. Let me tell you what the Lord's spoken to me for you and given me a word of knowledge. You hear what I'm telling you? Nobody ever come to me. Nobody ever mentioned. Nobody nobody ever just came up and laid hands on me and began to pray for me. 
without my having to beg and plead people to pray for me. I knew a fellow in New York City trying to hurry today, but I may not do real well. I knew a young man in New York City. He tested positive for HIV. Doctors tested him. They said his T cell count was like 200 and something, which is low. It wasn't quite at the level of an AIDS diagnosis. An AIDS diagnosis is under 200 T cells. He was a little over 200. One day he was at the house and I was in my kitchen working and I, I don't, it, 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 he'd go to church with us and stuff, you know, and he was in an apostolic church. He had received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He was a member of the LGBT community. But I just, this, this spirit of intercession came over me as I'm in the kitchen cooking literally and I begin to pray and I begin to seek God and I'm calling out to God and I mean I'm getting in the spirit and I'm just feeling the spirit of intercession all of a sudden the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said go lay hands on him I walked over to him I laid my hands on him and I rebuked that HIV and I said God I'm asking you to heal him in the name of Jesus let the healing power of God be known in this life right now not going to give you a timetable because I'm not sure. It was a couple weeks or so. He went back to the doctor and they did more blood work. The doctor said to him, you're not going to believe this. He said, what? He said, your T cells are normal. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, a normal T cell count is over 1,200. Your T cell count is over from 200 and something in a couple of weeks. It had gone to over 1,200. He said, that's impossible. The doctor told him, he said, that's impossible. It is impossible. There's no way in the universe you can be HIV positive, have a T cell count a few weeks ago of 200 and something, and all of a sudden, two weeks later, be at normal levels. Folks, that was in 1993 that that happened. That fella is an apostolic preacher and he's still preaching and he's still living today. Oh, I want to tell you something. God has ways of letting you know I've got your back. God has ways of telling you, I've got your back. I want you to understand today, you know, one of the reasons this preacher craves a church full of people that love God and love to worship and love to pray and love to live for the Lord with all their might is because I know the power that exists in a church like that. I wouldn't worry about dealing with sickness and illness if I had a church like that. I wouldn't worry about it for a minute because I know there was somebody in the congregation who would know how to get hold of God for me. You hear what I'm telling you? We've had people in this church, we've had 10, 12, 15 people coming to church, had people bragging about them being filled with the Holy Ghost, and in the middle of all my sickness and all my trouble, how many times, Tommy, did they ever get up and walk over and pray for me? Never happened. I'd go through bouts of depression because I was struggling with so much. And I'd literally have to blow a gasket in order to get this person to understand I needed somebody to hold me up in prayer because I was about to lose it. Amen. Like right that. now I go through... I have some really, 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 really bad days. I had a really miserable day a couple days ago. There are times I wake up in the morning and partly because of the diabetes, I have to take thyroid medicine that I have to wait an hour before I can eat. Well, if my blood sugar during the night gets too low, my whole personality changes and I turn into a lunatic. Lose my temper easy, get upset, 
holler and yell. Yes, I do. I'm confessing it. I'm admitting it. I'm not one of those preachers get up here and try to tell you, oh, I'm perfect, hallelujah. You need to follow me because I'm perfect. No, it ain't about follow me because I'm perfect. It's follow me because I know the way. And the only reason I know the way is because God's shown it to me. Amen. I'm doing my best just like you're doing your best. But I had a horrible day. I woke up and, brother, I'm telling you, I felt like I was dying. I felt... I had no strength in my body. I was Sounds just like miserable. My God, I was in a horrible frame. Sounds of mind. like me. I'd give anything to have a Holy Ghost filled person who's in touch with God who sends me a message and says, Brother, the Lord laid on my heart to pray for you today. I'm going to tell you, sometimes at Riverside Church of God, sometimes the Lord will let people know I've got your back. And it was done in the simplest way. He'd lay you on somebody's heart that week. And they'd be praying for you. And then Sunday would come and they'd come to you and say, You know something, Brother John? All week long, I've had a heavy burden for you. And I've been praying for you all week long because God put a burden in my heart for you. And Tommy, when you'd hear them say those words, that let you know God's got your back. He puts you on that person's heart. How many times have we seen that with all the, quote, Holy Ghost filled people we've had in our... We haven't. It's sad because that's the kind of church I believe God wants us to have. You have no idea. There are people out there. You have no idea. There are days when I'm struggling and I'm struggling and I'm yes. struggling and I'm struggling and then all of a sudden a message will come through in the email or a message will come through on Facebook Messenger and they'll let me know, you have no idea, brother, how much your ministry means to me. You have no idea how much of a blessing I received from your church online and I appreciate you. And I, it, They don't have to send a nickel, just the words. Lifts me up and encourages me, doesn't it, Booby? I've had horrible days, and all of a sudden I'll get a message, and I'll tell Tommy, I'll say, boy, honey, if ever there was a day I needed a message like that, it was today. Mm -hmm. You see, that's God letting you know, I've got your back. Yes. Hallelujah. You're not alone in this thing. There are times when offerings will come in. Yeah. Just a week or so ago, my mother started a new job at uh, Walmart. And just a week or so ago, had bills needing to be paid. And I sat there and I said, Lord, I don't know what in the world I'm going to do. I'm going to have to put it on a credit card again because there ain't nothing in the world I can do otherwise. And then all of a sudden, Mom had sent her tithe. First time since starting this new job. And I wrote her back and I said, man, you can't know how perfect the timing was. You just, you can't even know. I was just just about in the depths of despair. And then all of a sudden, you see, when people obey God, when they do what the Lord's called them to do, they don't know how much of a blessing. Amy, bless her heart. Marvin, you have no idea how much you bless this preacher and how much you, you minister to this preacher, how much you help me to get through these hard times. Claude, the same thing is true. There'll come a time in our lives when we, like Daniel, are troubled. It's not always the enemy who's coming against us that brings us our trouble. Sometimes it's simply a life circumstance or a situation. Sometimes we're struggling to understand something which is of great importance to us. Amen. But while our struggle may not be with the enemy, listen to me carefully, our answer may be delayed by the enemy. <laughs> so just because what you're going through, don't blame the devil for everything you're going through. I hate when people do that. Oh, the devil did this to me. The devil did that to me. More Christians bring more glory to Satan every Sunday than they do to God. Because all they talk about is, oh, the devil did this, the devil, the devil made me sick, the devil made... No, there ain't nothing the devil can do that God don't allow. Amen? I will say that God's the one who's in charge of things. God's the one who's in charge of believers' lives. There ain't nothing the devil can do to me that God hadn't allowed. And if he's allowed it, then there must be some good purpose in it. 
So somewhere along the line, I'm going to glean something good from all the trouble that I'm experiencing today. I believe yeah, that. Yeah, that sounds like me. I believe that. But I want to tell you, it's not always the enemy who's bringing your trouble to you, but listen to me. But a lot of times it's the enemy who's delaying you from finding the peace, from finding joy, from ridding yourself of the anxiety. You see, the enemy's not the one causing the problem, but he's delaying the Lord's being able to bring you relief. Do you follow what I'm telling you? That angel told Daniel, God heard you from day one, but it's taken me three weeks to get here. Do you hear me today? Oh, I want to tell you, the devil, he wasn't the one fighting with Daniel. Daniel's initial issue had nothing in the world to do with the devil. But the answer he needed was delayed because of the enemy. I want to tell you today, the enemy loves to watch us struggle. Yes. He loves to watch us uh, yes. go through difficulty. He loves to see us depressed and despondent. He loves to see us in the depths of despair and depression. But while our struggle may not be with the enemy, our answer may very well be delayed by the enemy. Oh my goodness, listen, in 1 Thessalonians 2, 17 and 18, the Apostle Paul writes, But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, listen, but Satan hindered us. You know, it's funny, a lot of times there are things that a church would go through. you got to remember, the church is a body. This, this is something a lot, a lot of crazy folks don't seem to understand. When you become part of a church, you become part of a body. And as part of the body, something may happen to one member like the pastor. And it's not happening to him because of him or for him. It's happening to him because of you and for you. Because you're part of the body. God wants to see how are you going to respond. How are you going to react? Are you going to do what you're supposed to do? Are you going to handle this thing the way you're supposed to handle it? Do you follow what I'm telling you now? Oh, I won't tell you. There are times when there are things that happen in the church. And it doesn't happen because of Sister Rose. Or it doesn't happen because of Brother John. No, it happens because the Lord is allowing that situation to come about. So the pastor can respond to it and do the way the pastor is supposed to do. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? You see, we're a body. There are times something happens to one member and the other member has to respond. You ever get bit by a mosquito on your arm? Yeah. And boy, that hurts. Now, how many of us run up against the wall and go like this to try to kill that mosquito? No. What do we do? We take our other hand, don't we? Slap. Splat. That mosquito's dead. Solve that problem. How did I solve that problem? I solved it with another member of the body. Amen. You follow me today? I solved it with one member got bit, but the other member took care of the mosquito. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Yep. That's what happens in the church. Sometimes things happen so that God can see that the other members of the body are reacting the way they ought to be reacting and doing the way they ought to be doing. The gifts of the Spirit operate in the church to benefit and bless God's people. Amen. I told you the story of this sister that I went to and ministered to in Dairy Queen. Folks, I'm here to tell you, that didn't do nothing for me, but it sure did something for her. Hallelujah. The gifts of the Spirit are there to minister to the people of God. We, are, we ought to be desiring in our lives, Lord, give me opportunity to minister to others. Give me opportunity to be a blessing to others. Oh, I want to tell you, God found a way to let that dear sister know that he had her back. I'm here to tell you as a child of God today, God's got your back. Lastly, this afternoon, I want to read to you 1 Chronicles 20, 15-17. It was a prophetic word spoken to the people of Israel. 
as they faced off in battle with an enemy. The word of God said, And he said, Hearken ye, all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat. Thus saith the Lord unto you, be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude. <laughs> Ooh, glory. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go ye down against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz. And ye shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. Amen. Listen to verse 17. Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. What was God telling Israel? I've got your back. Hallelujah. I've got your back.